Hello, bruv. I'm back with The Black Knight by Mrs. Alfred Sidgwick and Crosby Garston. We'll resume at chapter two, if I can find it. No, it's further down. Let us do it, bruvs. Chapter two. Nearly all the occupants of the emigrant coach were asleep. When Thorley entered it again, it had the appearance of a charnel house. Trays had been lowered from the ceiling and boards fitted to fill the gap between seats. Of these, in various stages of undress, lay the passengers. The sickly electric light shone dimly on the motionless frame. Forms of men, women, and children huddled in layers, frozen in the grotesque attitudes in which sudden death-like sleep had smitten them. Here a man lay, his thin knees drawn almost up to his chin, his teeth showing in the gleaming canine snarl. There a woman slumbered a cheaply ringed hand, trailing among the litter on the floor, breathing faintly under a veil of her own tumbled hair. A black trousered leg hung out of an upper berth like the dead bough of a tree, toes and heel protruding through the greasy sock. The air was warm with the heat of packed bodies and acrid with mingled breathings. Thorley took off his boots and, climbing into the upper tray, placed them in his overcoat under his head and closed his eyes. But sleep would not come. Try as he may, he would not, he could not, he would, try as he would, he could not get the little clerk's words out of his head. Every penny we'd scraped and saved for 13 years gone. Corn, corn. Blame good mind to chuck meself in the river. So spirit this in an Irish accent, but killed her pa, I did. He'd met Isaiah Winter personal and shook his shook hands with him. Isaiah Winter, his father, president of the great amalgamated workers mutual benefit trust company, the greatest swindle since the South. I don't know what this is. C? It's crossed out. C bubble, maybe? I don't know. South. South C bubble. I have no clue what that is. Well, if it had crushed the clerk in its fall, it had crushed him too. Five years ago, he was at Marlboro. Two years ago, he was at Oxford. A month ago, he was a gilded youth about town, going the pleasant, expensive route, yachting in the Solent, shooting in Norfolk, deer stalking in Scotland, hunting in Leicestershire, Lisa Leicestershire, back back in the splendid Park Lane house for the season, rotten row canters, operas, first nights, dances, and so on. And now, and now here he was under an assumed name, a fugitive from the same golden past rolling westwards into the oblivion of a new world ten dollars in his pocket to sweat blood for a farm labor's pittance 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 good good reading there bubby i gotta put something under this so it doesn't it lays flat he was still dazed by the suddenness of it all should he have seen the collapse coming? How could he? His father had been firmly against his entering the business, had, take, had never taken him into his confidence in the least thing. He knew nothing of the affairs of the amalgamated workers, and they had maintained their own private state up to the very last tragical moment. Minute. I can't read tonight. All part of the gigantic bluff, he supposed. Thinking backwards, he wondered if Isaiah Winter had himself known the end was at hand. He thought not, was sure of it. When the old man joined the Carmen Sita at South Sea on Monday of Cow's Week, 
There was nothing in this manner to be token that he was even uneasy. An incongruous figure, dressed in gray flannels and the black string tie, he wore continual, continually as if to remind himself of the days when he had been a Methodist lay preacher. He had mixed, as usual, with his guests, chafing his powerful hands together, scattering heavy jokes and ponderous compliments, smiling parental, parentally, perennially, yeah, that's right, you dullard, altogether up to his usual form. It was Todd, his father's confidential secretary, who had brought the news, Thomas Eustace Manley Todd. The urbane, the obsequious, necessary Todd. That was on Wednesday. Michael was taking Mary Anderless, her aunt, Lady Chiltern, Tony Fargion, and a few others ashore to tea on the club lawn. As the launch neared the landing stage, it passed the shore boat, putting out, and Todd was seated in the stern sheets thereof. Fawn gloves in one hand, gold-handed malacca in the other, staring away up the road so intently that he did not notice the launch's approach until Michael hallooed it almost in his ear. Then he bounded a foot off his seat, off the seat, strengthened the glasses on his nose, recognized Michael, and springing to his feet, waved gloves and cane excitedly and shouted, Hi, hi, where's your father? In so steep a pitch, it approached the shriek. On board, Michael bawled and answered and laughed delightedly. As the shore boat caught in the launch's wash suddenly bucked Todd off his balance, and he went out of sight with a wild waving of legs and arms. Billy Fargion sniggered. What's the matter with the immaculate Tommy? He had his straw hat on the wrong way round, and his tie was .25 of a millimeter out of the straight. World coming to an end? The governor has probably forgotten he was due to lay a foundation stone of appropriate prayers for the little Muddleton peculiar Baptist, said Michael. It was his fashion to sneer at his parents' religious connections and shutting off the engine steered the launch in among the school of bobbing dinghies that hung about the stage like a family of ducklings. He spent a pleasant hour or so dawdling over tea, watching Mary Anderless's cameo profile against the blue of the summer solent. Lady Chilton, Chiltern's scandalous gossip tickling one ear, the strains of the Royal Marine Band playing selections from the Mikado flirting with the other, then, gathering his party, shepherded them back to the haunch, the launch. I say the Carmen seat is firing up, said Tony Fargion as they pushed off. Michael's gaze swept over the fleet of white yachts that rode at their anchors like a flock of sleeping seabirds to where the graceful bulk of the Carmen Sita towered above them all. Fargion was right. She was firing up. A brown haze of smoke streamed from her straw-colored funnel, smudging the still evening air. As he looked, a gig, floating by her side, left the water and went jerking upwards towards its davits. Old man must be going for a cruise, he said. Wonder what the idea is. Oh, some delightful surprise, I expect. Your dear father is so full of them, Lady Chiltern. Drawled and turning again, asked a bigot, Poole, if his darling aunt was still infatuated with her chiropodist. The mate was standing at the head of the ladder when they came aboard. He touched his cap to Michael and shouted to the, lun the, to the launch crew to hook on the falls. What's the game, Michael inquired of him. Going for a moonlight trip around the island, I believe, sir, the man replied. Mr. Todd gone ashore? No, sir. I think he must be stopping aboard for the night. A steward came up and paid off the shore boat about half an hour ago. Ten minutes later, as he sat in the smoking saloon, drinking whiskey and soda with Tony Fargion and Bigot Poole, he heard the anchor coming in. 
as he went below to change, the twin engines began to turn over. His father did not show up for dinner. He sent a message by a steward to say that he and Tommy Todd were engrossed in business and were remaining in his stateroom, not to be disturbed on any account. Bigot Pool came in late. I mean, what a bad name, Bigot Pool. Came in late and excused himself on the plea that he had been watching the maneuvers of a launch that had put out from the shore just as the Carmen Cita had got underway and had followed her some distance. Fellow got up in the bows and made harsh noises at us with a megaphone, he said. Couldn't hear what his trouble was, but he seemed to want us to stop. Old Penny wasn't having any, though. Held straight on. Chap got sick of lumping about in our wash after a bit and switched off towards Portsmouth. Portsmouth. He can come, he can come and tell us about it tomorrow, said Michael, and turn to listen. No, oh, I'm supposed to stop after the quotations. Said Michael and turned to listen to a verbal duel between Lady Chiltern and old Monty such a vrol, vrol. It had been a cheery dinner. Bigot Pool had obliged with a piquant episode concerning a Spanish dancer, a bishop in the Madrid Express. Those inimitable crosstalk comedians, the Lafroy twins, quarreled amusingly across the table, and old Monty, pinked by Lady Chiltern's rapier tongue, came wholly awake for once and pawed out left and right like a baited bear. And when tired of the chatter, there was Mary Anderless, this is calm loveliness, to turn to <laughs> Mary Anderless presiding at the feast like some serene queen of beauty. A child at the rear end of the coach whimpered miserably. A woman woke with a sigh and sought to hush it, her voice heavy with sleep. The great Swede lumberman on the berth opposite suddenly launched both hands in the air as if to clutch something elusive and dear, moaning aloud in the agony of his dreams. A man in shirt and trousers rolled out of his berth, blundered br blindly from side to side of the gangway, got his bearings, and patted the length of the coach in his stocking feet. Michael could hear him drinking from the tap in the lavatory outside, a swish of water gulping and then a crash. Presently, he padded back again. As he passed under the lamp, Michael saw that his chin was dripping blood. Regaining his end of the, the car, he was paused. He paused, uncertain as to where he belonged. Selecting a berth at random, he made towards it, but a trousered leg shooting suddenly out of it caught him squarely on the chest and sent him reeling backwards across the gangway. The edge of the opposite berth took him behind the knees, and he fell within, collapsing like a pithed bollock. A woman screamed, a man snarled, a fist started on bone, and the intruder was flung out of the berth, landing on his back on the floor. He sighed and abandoning the hopeless search, rolled over on his face, pillowed his head on his forearms, and snored. Michael's mind swaying back into the dear dead past, and he was sitting with Mary Anderless again on the deck of the Carmen Sita as that white beauty rushed onwards into the heart of the summer night, silver shod with foam. A great waning moon lifted out of the sea here and there in the hinterlands of the sky. A few pale stars blinked. Half a mile away, a North German Lloyd boat was standing in for the needles, ablaze with lights from stem to stern. Her hand was playing on deck, the strains of Rosalind Ulf der Heide. I don't speak German, sorry. I don't know how to speak German. I don't know how to speak Italian. I don't know how to speak French. Any of it. I can barely speak English, as you can tell by my awful reading. Her hand was playing on deck. The strains of Rosalind Ulf der Heide came to him distinctly over the water. He lounged. Silent in a contented drowse lullaby by the magic night. Well fed, well dressed, careless of fate, the cool wind on his brow gliding over moonlit seas to the sound of far sweet music. 
Up forward, Bigot Poole had got the big cabinet gramophone out and was dancing with one of the one of the Lefroy twins. Lady Chiltern, a cigar in her teeth, was patrolling amidships, her arm firmly hooked into that of Wilbur Maskeline, the novelist. She was relating scandalous stories of the inner lives of her arch enemies in the hopes that he would be attracted by their picturesque and turn them into copy by their pictures picturesqueness and turn them into copy. Old Monty Sash Satchavral, his huge body compressed into a Madeira chair a briar pipe sticking out of the side of his mouth, a whiskey and soda clenched in his enormous hand, was drawing Rabelaisian yarns to a circle of sniggering youngsters. Tony Farjohn wandered up and, halting opposite Michael, leaned against the rail and puffed a smoke ring or two downwind. "'Where are we off to, G now?' he asked presently. "'I had something about a run.' Round the island, said Michael. We're making a dash big loop round it then. Farzan grunted. Can't see a flicker of St. Catherine's light, Rav. Gabner must have altered his mind, said Michael unconcernedly. Must have, Farzan agreed and strolled away. He was back again in five minutes. Does it strike you she's hopping it a bit, he asked. Michael considered the Carmen Cita certainly was trembling more than was her want, and the smoke was rolling out of her funnel in dense clouds. He s nodded to Farjan. Yes, she is shifting. She's doing 18.5 as a matter of fact. Just read it on the log. That's a trifle over a limit, ain't it? Farjan queried. Michael whistled. 18.5, yes. By Jove, she's all out. Also, it may interest you to know that she's pointing roughly southwest by south at this m <laughs> at this minute, bruv. Farjan went on, of course, which is more likely to set us off Yushant in the morning from West Coves. I say, what's the antic? Michael laughed. My dear chap, I don't know. I'm never let into these s secrets. One of the governor's little surprises, I suppose. He's always pulling them off. We went to sleep at Anchor in Carnarvon Bay one night last summer and woke up at Kingston with the launch overside ready to take us to Bell Bowles Ridge and the Dublin Horseshoe Show. <sighs> then, in this case, we should probably wake up off Farrell one of these fine mornings and find the launch waiting to take us to a bullfight. Exactly. I shouldn't worry, anyhow. We're not kidnapping you, Tony. You'll see your little ride to back in this again. Farjon blinked. I'm not worrying, bruv. I'm wondering, that's all. All for Queenie. Don't mention her, please. All is between. All is over between us. She prefers a richly be-pimpled individual called Abbott. Herb to all real friends. They have the same taste in nougat. Is that nougat? Oh, nougat. Nougat and novelettes. I'm going to take my broken heart to bye-byes now. So good night. He slouched away. Michael heard him brawling playfully with Bigot Pool on the companionway. And the shrill partisan exhortations of the Lefroy twins... He saw Mary Andrus below, Anderless below and then went on deck again for a final cigarette before turning in. The sea was empty except for a Norwegian bark which lay close hauled across the path of the moon, every sail showing up against the silvery wash like a silhouette cut from black paper. The Carmen Sita, like a pale ghost in the moonlight, rushed on and on, a hissing plume of foam, at her forefoot, a gleaming ribbon of froth reeling out from under her counter. Michael could feel her trembling through her thin skin with the pull and thrust of the racing engines and wondered, wondered mildly at the hurry. His father was wont to dash hither and thither at the bidding of his restless moods. 
But the flyaway in the middle of Cow's Week, the pick of the season, was both absurd and annoying. He climbed to the bridge and found the maid in charge, tramping to and fro like a caged animal. Couldn't say what we're bound for, so he replied to Michael's question. Captain Penny didn't tell me anything, and I'm not sure that he knows himself, bruv. Beyond you, Shant, we can't be going very far, as we're not bunkered for a long trip. And at the rate they're burning it now, it'll barely take us across the bay. It'll be La Rochelle or Bordeaux, I expect, sir. What's doing at Bordeaux? The mate shrugged his shoulders. Nothing that I know of, sir. Never cared for the place myself, though. There's plenty of good cheap wine there. And the girls is lively. Something caught his eye. He turned on his heel and pointed astern. A shaft of bright light shot suddenly up from the horizon, then drooping, swept swiftly across the surface of the sea. Portland light, Michael inquired. The mate shook his head. Oh no, sir. That's miles out of sight away over there, he pointed again. That there is a searchlight. Cruisers maneuvering, I expect. As they watched the qu questing beam, as they watched, the questing beam found the Norwegian bark, turning it in a flash from black to white. It hovered on in f on it for a minute, then swept away eastwards again, slowly, deliberately probing the night. He's looking for something, said the mate. Well, I hope he finds it, said Michael with a laugh, tossed his cigarette overboard, and turned in. He woke to the noise of men's voices shouting outside him to find his cabin ablaze with light. The engines had stopped. He had a momentary idea that it was morning and that the Carmen Cita was birthing in some port. Then he saw that the light that was pouring in through his open porthole was artificial, and from the gentle lift and droop of the cabin, he knew that they were still in mid-channel. Is that the yacht Carmen Cita came a hail from away to starbo starboard? Michael heard old Penny's voice answer from the bridge. It's his, and who are you, HM Destroyer, Ada? What do you want with me? You'll soon find out. Why didn't you leave, heave to before? Couldn't read your signals. Time you learnt to, then. Is the owner aboard? Yes. Then stand by and drop a ladder. There's a potty coming aboard. Bell rang and the destroyer's bowels and her starboard engine pounded slowly. Michael pulled on his trousers and a coat and went on deck. The destroyer was coming alongside a dark, low lying, viperish thing, her narrow deck cluttered with torpedo tubes and quick firers, the fangs of her sting, a tall figure, and a pea jacket hung over her. Her bridge dodger snapping occasional orders. A small group of men stood amidship waiting to board. She chafed her flank gently against the Carmen Cita's fenders, and two men immediately ran up the ladder to the yaks. Yaks? The yaks. Should have hired Ed Bagley Jr. for this reading. The fine, the yaks. <laughs> I can't say it. The yachts deck. Michael saw to his surprise that they were civilians. Old Penny met them. I'm captain of this ship, he growled. What's all this about? The bigger of the two men tapped his overcoat pocket. We're from Scotland Yard with a warrant for the arrest of Mr. Isaiah Winter. The old sailor's jaw dropped. Arrest Mr. Winter? What the devil for? He laughed. You're joking. I'm not. Wish I was. The, the defect. The defect. <laughs> the defective grunted. I'm just going to keep defected in there. The detective grunted ruefully. The amalgamated workers has gone smash. And there's Mary L. Luce. Captain Penny grabbed him by the arm. Amalgamated workers gone smash. Hey, matey. You don't mean that. He whined. Be careful what you say. I'm an old man, mate. Fact, said the detective. It was all over town this afternoon. Panic wasn't the word for it. I don't know how bad it is yet. Mind you, got anything in it? Every cent. Every bloody cent. 
insured their chew. Bad luck, old man, but there's thousands of others like you. I've been stung a bit myself, to tell the truth. Well, I must go and cop the bird. Show me where he is, will you? I don't believe it. Taint possible, muttered the captain stubbornly as he led the way below. Mistake somewhere. Amalgamated workers. Why, it's too big. Couldn't go bust. All a mistake. Mr. Winter will explain. Ridiculous. Thus muttering and mumbling, suddenly very bent in age, he shambled down the companionway, the two Scotland Yard men at his heels. I don't know if I'm going to finish this chapter. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> Michael followed. He had a hazy impression of doors opening, voices babbling, and sleepy, startled faces. The Leroy twins, their faces ghastly with cold cream. Oh, what is it? Has anything happened? Masculine's tussled mop of hair nodding across that Lady Chiltern, almost bald without her wig. What's the matter, a collision? Some delightful surprise of Mr. Winters, I suppose. Monty Sacavrel in lilac pajamas, gaping toothlessly. The procession reached his father's door, and the captain knocked. Mr. Winters, sir, excuse. He was answered by a sharp, ear-stabbing explosion. Monty Sacavrel fell backwards over his washstand. The Leroy twins screamed in concert. Lady Chiltern clapped her hands over her eyes and moaned. The big detective detective snapped an oath, and springing past Captain Penny, drove all of his weight against the locked door, which gave him words before him. On the floor in the center of the great luxurious cabin, a heavily built man was laying, lying on his back, arms outflung, one leg drawn up, the lips were open, the strong yellow teeth clenched, light gray eyes staring at the ceiling in the middle of the big forehead, a round blue murk was bubbling blood. Over him a wisp of smoke drifted like a frail blue mist. The detective bent over him for a moment, then clumsily removed his bowler. He's, he'd given us to slip, Jim, he said, and his companions nodded. The captain darted forward. Hold on, that ain't Mr. Winter, he rasped. Mr. Winter had a beard, thick eyebrows. Not him, stranger, some mistake. Shaved his beard and plucked his eyebrows, said the big detective. Best thing they do when they run for it was going to ship at Faro or Karuna, most likely. Hello, what's that? They all turned and saw something move. Something more in a corner, something crouched and shrunken. It was Tommy Todd. He was squatting on his hunkers, his eyes staring out of his head, sucking his fingers and slobbering. As the detective stepped towards him, he began to giggle. Well, that was a nail-biter. Chapter 3 will come next, profs. Goodbye.